Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Lord Richard Laird. Um, he is well known as co-director of the Wellbeing Programme at the Centre for Economic Performance at uh, LSE, but also, and why he's here with us, he's chair and founder of the Action for Happiness. So uh, we'd like to welcome him to stage uh, to inspire us with Actions for Happiness. Thank you. Well, um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I've uh, always been a great fan of your, your movement, and I'm, I'm interested to note that your movement was founded uh, in 2011, which is the same year that we founded Action for Happiness. And I think at the time when this was done, these were both rather counter-cultural counter kind of things to be doing. Uh, you know, what's loneliness really as an issue? It's sort of not something we normally want to think about, and happiness, wow, there's something a bit funny about that. Um, <laughs> and and um, here's an example. Uh, when we interviewed for the first director, um, one of the candidates had uh, searched the web for any other organisation that had the word happiness in the title. Uh, and what came back on his screen was, your search for happiness has produced no results. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, w I think we are in a different world now. Uh, and Julianne has been describing the change in the prominence attaching to loneliness. I think this is part of a much bigger movement um, where people are willing to talk about feelings uh, as the ultimate reality for human beings. Um, uh, and that is what is driving it. So there's plenty of evidence that people are more psychologically aware in general. If you ask people, do you think people are more psychologically aware? More and more people uh, answer yes to that question. Um, here's something I asked one of my research assistants to do, to go into The Guardian and find out how many articles had been written on happiness or well-being uh, uh, each year since 2010. Uh, the number on happiness has doubled, but the number on mental health has gone up by a factor of five. I mean, that is something quite, quite extraordinary uh, that has been happening. Things that were never talked about at all uh, are being talked about uh, by the, the public. Um, these issues are also beginning to be discussed um, by policymakers. Um, the Secretary General of the OECD um, got his uh, governments to agree he could say that the aim of government uh, is the well-being of the people. This is quite a new language from you know, the most dynamic economy of the world or the highest GDP per head. Uh, a huge improvement. Uh, the UN uh, hosts the World Happiness Report launch uh, that we have each, each year. I hope you uh, are uh, able to have a look at that. Um, very interesting one coming out next March. Um, even the British Treasury um, say in their uh, manual on how policy should be appraised that they... Um, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> the, the, the US Treasury say that... Um, what policy is about is social well-being. Uh, this, this is a, 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 big, a big change. So how could we have a happier society? Well, I think we need a, a, a complete and explicit uh, uh, revolution in the priorities which people talk about for society. Uh, and I want to uh, argue that that is not only what people are beginning to want increasingly, but it's increasingly practical because of the knowledge base having gone up so much due to the new science of happiness coming from psychology and other disciplines. So can you hear me all right here? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted to just give you three facts from three separate studies. First, what are the causes of the huge variation in happiness in the population? This is based on a book called The Origins of Happiness, uh, recently, for which I was a co-author. Um, and we looked at uh, longitudinal data for many advanced countries and even poorer countries. Um, and of course, we find that if you want to explain this variation, uh, income plays a very small part in explaining the variation. Uh, even physical health plays quite a small part. The big parts are played by human relationships, social connections, 
uh, Julian said, uh, and by mental health. So social connections, always the family uh, relations come first, whether you have a partner, whether the quality of your relation with your partner is good, then whether you have work, assuming you want it, what the quality of the work is, uh, and then the quality of your local community. These are the basic social connections that we have, uh, <coughs> family, uh, work, and uh, community. Uh, and then there's mental health, uh, which is a huge, hugely important factor varying across people. That's the individuals within a country. Then, of course, uh, and you don't pick this up if you just look at individuals in the country, there's a whole culture of the country. So this has been really well studied um, by my colleague John Helliwell in the World Happiness Report, uh, and he gives this analysis each year. Um, and, of course, if you want to you know, there's a huge range from the Scandinavian countries who are scoring something like uh, 7.5... Maybe, maybe nearly eight out of 10 for life satisfaction down to uh, Rwanda or uh, even more Syria, something like four and a half. To explain this variation, conflict is a, a bit of it for some countries, but the, the biggest single variable is what, the, what they call social support. Do you have someone uh, you can rely on to help you in time of trouble? Very important. And the next one is trust that Julian mentioned. Um, do you think most other people can be trusted? In Scandinavia, like 65, 70% say, I don't know. Sardinia is a little bit complicated because of the mafia. <laughs> 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 they trust people within the family, but they don't trust everybody. <laughs> but, you know, you're going from, from something like uh, 60 or 70% in Scandinavian countries, but quite high in Germany, down to uh, Britain and America, 30% only. And that's fallen from 60% uh, half a century ago to 30% now. And I think this is due to this uh, terrible growth in the competitive uh, culture um, which we have, where people increasingly feel that their aim in life has got to be to be as successful as they can compared with other people. Uh, that is a terrible objective. It's, of course, a zero-sum game because if I'm more successful, somebody else is less successful. Um, we, we can't uh, have a happier society until we get into the framework of a positive-sum game where we get our satisfaction from uh, making other people happier um, as well as our, ourselves. And if we are wanting to understand uh, what is now adding to this competitive culture, here's my third fact. Uh, I think that the social media are adding to the degree of competition and constant comparison of self with others, um, which is going on. So this is beautifully documented in the book uh, by Jean Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E, -E, called iGen. Uh, I thought this was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and she documents uh, the history of, of the fraction of people spending, young, these are teenagers, spending their time online, sort of flat till 2010, and then whoop. Uh, and then she has lovely graphs of what are the fraction of teenagers who say they feel lonely? Flat, whoop. <laughs> who say they feel left out? Left out. <coughs> flat, whoop. Feel depressed, flat, whoop. That's, of course, uh, that doesn't prove causality, but it, it introduces an interesting question. There are a few trials <coughs> where people have been randomly assigned to be allowed to use their Facebook or have their Facebook uh, account blocked for a week, and the people who are blocked from Facebook uh, are substantially happier than the control group um, by the end of the week. Um, I think this, this is a pretty persuasive uh, issue, uh, and Julian mentioned it, and I'm very much persuaded by that. So, so we know that, from what she said, <laughs> some of the other things I've said, that social connections uh, are critical uh, for personal happiness. <coughs> so what can be done about it? Now, there are many people here who know much, much more about it uh, than I do, but we were having an interesting conversation um, before, uh, what, are, what are the common ingredients in all these different forms of intervention uh, to try and reduce loneliness? And um, I was asking, checking up, <laughs> whether is it true that in most of these interventions, 
a criti uh, an, an important element at least, if not the critical element, is that the person who will otherwise be lonely begins to feel more useful to other people. And I think that that is, is critical in the overcoming of loneliness, <coughs> that you get out of yourself uh, and into uh, connection with the life of other people and, and feel useful uh, to other people. So uh, I think we need uh, this, this change in culture. Uh, it's especially necessary for young people because I think that the values that uh, they are acquiring uh, are increasingly frightening. Uh, and we do need a culture <coughs> where people think of their main purpose in life as being to contribute uh, to the community and to the happiness uh, of other people. So let me just mention um, the absolutely extraordinarily successful treatment which uh, my colleague David Clark, with whom um, I've been working on the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies program in Britain. Um, David is a leading clinical psychologist at world level, uh, and one of his most successful programs is for the treatment of social anxiety. And uh, I suppose you could say that the essence of the treatment, this is incredibly simplifying it, but the essence of the treatment is that instead of always worrying about yourself and the impression you're making, which is what causes <coughs> social anxiety, you actually realize <laughs> that the way to uh, relate to somebody else is not to worry about how you're coming over, but to be interested in the other person. Uh, and that, that's what, what makes for a, an effective social exchange. Um, and essentially, step by step, very carefully, um, they're able within, I think, about eight sessions uh, to move people from extreme feelings of is isolation, anxiety, uh, to symptom-free, 80%. Even more interesting, he's now put this online. And the online treatment has a success rate of what? 80%. So that th this is what Julian was saying, the thinking style. If you can change your thinking style, you can overcome many of the sources of loneliness which are actually arising from inside yourself. Uh, and that's a very important thing. It, uh, the, the, ca the campaign against loneliness is not just a campaign to get other people to help the lonely, it's to getting the lonely to help themselves. <coughs> so we need this new culture um, where people's uh, aim is to uh, essentially to uh, help other people. Um, and there's lots of evidence, and actually the World Happiness Report uh, next March <laughs> will have a lot of it in, that of course helping other people um, helps you. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in giving we receive. Um, lots of experimental evidence and lots of real world evidence from, from natural experiments. No time to, to talk about that. Um, but what I do want to talk about is um, the link between what you're trying to do and what Action of Happiness uh, is trying to do because uh, Action of Happiness is trying to produce the, the, this change in culture uh, which is necessary. So the fundamental concept, of course, is what is your purpose in life? And we have uh, a pledge which all members of Action of Happiness take when they join the movement, which is that I will try to create as much happiness uh, in the world as I can and uh, as little unhappiness. And that is, is crucial. I think it, it's funny. I've, I actually felt that having taken that pledge myself, it had some effect, <laughs> I like to think, on, on my, my own behavior. Um, so we've got 120,000 people who've signed up online, a million people following the site. But really, face, uh, it, it's a bit um, uh, uh, limited to think that you can change people's face-to-face -face relationships just by something online. You can't uh, beyond a certain point. So um, what we're also doing is building these face-to-face -face groups. Um, <coughs> and to uh, launch these groups, we start with uh, a very wonderful course. I didn't design it, so I can say that. Um, <coughs> called Exploring What Matters, which is about you know what is our fundamental purpose, what makes us happy, but how can we also make other people happy, <coughs> an eight-session course. <coughs> um, we, were, we were a bit inspired uh, in uh, 
designing this um, by the Alpha Course. I don't know how many people know about the Alpha Course. It has actually been quite a successful uh, mechanism for uh, revitalizing the evangelical movement in the Anglican Church. Um, and I think there are lessons that any movement can take from it. Um, <coughs> courses are, 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 are a necessary element in a movement because people, they need to know what, is, what are the tools that they are using uh, to promote their cause. Um, <coughs> so uh, these, mov th these uh, courses, um, we've had 250 so far, um, are run by volunteers. Uh, so anyone here who wants to volunteer, please tell me. <laughs> um, uh, but we've done an RCT, uh, Randomized Controlled Trial, on the effect of the course and um, with a wait list control group. Um, and it was actually extraordinary, it surprised me, that the, the degree to which people are satisfied with their lives as, as a result of the course compared with before uh, goes up by more than the uh, amount by which people uh, life satisfaction is increased by getting a job from being unemployed. I mean, these are big changes, or equally bigger than the negative effect of losing a spouse. So these are huge changes if you get a change in your purpose in life. Um, so so um, that's all on the website. Please, if you're interested, go and, and visit our Action for Happiness websites. And I just want to end, there it is, yes, that's nice. Oh, look at those pictures. Let's <laughs> 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 see my listeners are here. No. Um, I wanted to end with the story of, of, of Jasmine, um, who came on one of these courses. And she's a, a 40 year old woman with uh, severe chronic pain. She's on crutches. She's got about five separate uh, conditions. Uh, and until she came on the course, uh, she'd hardly been out of the house for 10 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was refusing to see people. People wanted to see her. She didn't want to see people. Um, her pain treatment didn't seem to make any... Uh, med medication didn't seem to make much difference to her pain. And then by pure chance, she somehow saw about this course and went on this course. <coughs> and she found a purpose in life. And what was her purpose in life? was to help other people with chronic pain because she found that if you change your thinking style, you can change your relationship with your pain. It does, the pain doesn't go away, but your own emotional state uh, changes uh, in a profound way. Uh, and I, I thought her story was terrific. Actually, when we had the Dalai Lama to, to uh, uh, do some, some uh, PR for us, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she, came, she came up on the stage and they had a, a, a lovely embrace. It's very, 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 very touching. So I think that what we're doing is something very, very important, your movement uh, and, and ours. Uh, I, I do think these movements will go from, from strength to strength. Um, and I do believe that if we can get this fundamental uh, increase in social connection coming from a change in people's fundamental purpose in life, that that will, will create a, a, a happier society for everybody. Thank you very much. <coughs>feel inspired and just that little bit happier um, I want to know how to get Dalai Lama to do um, <laughs> PR for me um, I think uh, it, it's a fantastic start to the day um, mental attitude does count I work with older people and you can see some people who have lifelong problems with their attitude and their, uh, their ability to reach out and make friends so I think that's terribly important one of the things we know about older people is they're less likely though to uh, um, actually get access to talking therapies um, and when they do though they have better impact than for other age groups so we need to be able to people to access that kind of support um, and actually most of the interventions I see the really great ones are the ones where you can no longer tell the difference between the volunteer and the client 
actually the clients become the volunteer because you've given back some purpose and using their capacity. So that's great. And I, the thing I'm going to take away is the next time I'm embarrassing my teenage children in public, I shall say to them, uh, I've taken a pledge uh, to create happiness. Um, <laughs> so if I'm singing in the street, you get used to it. Um, so now, thank you so much. Fantastic speakers.